Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options education session. But today we're here to talk about futures trading with Tom Sosnoff with the new small futures exchange products. First of all, Tom, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I ah, love it, Tony. Happy to be here. Um, you and I, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the futures market. We're going to give everyone here who's relatively, uh, some of you have experience in trading options. Some of you are brand new. We're going to give you a, a quick dive through of just what an options, uh, I'm sorry, a futures contract uh, is. We're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of futures, a little bit about the benefits of ETFs and how the small exchanges really merge some of the benefits across both asset classes into a product that is suitable for retail traders. So, um, I'm really happy to get into this and, and let's get, go ahead and get started. So before we get started, what we're going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So like I said today, we're going to start off with just a quick intro to futures contracts. This is not a course on how to trade futures. We're just going to do a brief introduction. If you're interested in learning more, we can point you in the right direction to learn more about futures trading. We're going to introduce a little bit about futures products, what benefits you have with trading futures products, but also at the same time, what challenges there are with learning how to trade futures. You know, I, I started my derivatives trading in futures, and I have a good story about this to tell you in one second, Tom. Uh, but the challenges that you had with learning these futures products, that was really one of the, the tough things uh, about getting started with futures trading. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about ETFs, how they make things a little simpler, but the, uh, the, uh, the inefficiencies that some Sometimes you have with ETFs, we'll discuss some of that and how the small futures products has really changed and, and, and merged the, the benefits of both asset classes into one that is, again, like I said, simple and, and, and small for retail uh, traders. And then we're going to go through some examples of some trade ideas that Tom and I are going to talk through and, and show you how to access uh, these products through Tastyworks. Um, but Tom, I'll give you a second to introduce yourself, but before you do, I, I actually, you know, usually I tell this story about how I learned how to trade options using the Thinkorswim platform when you were teaching it back then on that platform, but I actually first started trading derivatives on futures before I started trading options, and, and I actually dug this up. Um, I had an old Twitter handle. And the Twitter handle was eMini TOS. It stood for the fact that I traded eMinis on the Thinkorswim platform. And I had thousands and thousands of tweets where I would, I would tweet about the trades that I was making, the levels that I was looking at on eMinis. So I was an eMinis trader first before I traded options. So again, I wouldn't be here talking about futures if it wasn't for you, know, you teaching uh, you know, futures trading back then. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, um, when when we got into the retail business and when we built Toss in 1999-2000, the number, the amount of business that was done in the futures community by individual investors, like retail investors like you and me and everybody else that's listening today, was less than, significantly less than 1%. The options volume was less than 9% and the retail um futures volume was less than 1%. It was, like, it was like less than a half a percent actually. And what's happened over the last 20 years is remarkable. And a lot of it has to do, Tony, it's mostly all about um, leverage and, and capital efficiency. You know, as we approach and get into 2021 and look beyond into the, you know, over the next decade, let's say, um, you know, the difference between Tony Zhang and Tom Sosnoff is going to be you know, how much capital do you have available to make different, like we're all going to understand how the game's play. So it's how much capital do you have to play on, on trade A or use on trade A, trade B and trade C so that you can even make a trade D. And, and that's really the, the key going forward. It's just capital efficiency. And what futures do is they make your capital just go further. They're just more efficient. That's all it is. Just don't think of them any other way other than a capital efficient, you know, contract. Yeah, so um, absolutely. And those are some of the things we're going to get into here today. So Tom, if you want to do just a quick introduction about yourself and, and the small future as far as kind of, sure. you know, what, what you were thinking when, when you started, why you wanted to start the, the, the small futures exchange. Sure. So I'll spend more time on that. So my name is Tom Sosnoff. I, I, I'm a veteran of this business for a long time, market maker for 20 years, built Thinkorswim um, from scratch and we sold it 10 years later and then built Tasty 
tasty trade and tasty works from scratch and and um um, and we're still running those companies right now. Um, but about 15 years ago, in 2000, right around 2005, 2006, um, as we were introducing people like Tony to the futures markets, I, I started to, um, I was getting, I was having an issue with the size of futures contracts. The average notional size of a futures contract is about $100,000 today. And some of them are a lot bigger, like the S&P minis, you know, it's, it's, it's over, it's, it's close to 200,000. Um, so, so contract sizes are very big and it didn't make sense to me how the average customer could have a $40,000 account, but was expected to buy a hundred to $150,000 worth of notional futures. Tony, the math didn't make sense to me. This is even going back to 2005. I'm like, how do you expect retail investors? And the response I got from the CME was, that's not our problem. We only care about institutional investors. And the response I got from other exchanges was, you know, Hey, listen, if you want to, if you want to create a, a smaller product, build it yourself. We don't have time for that. And so I'm like, okay, well, you challenged me. So we created a product back in 2005, 2006, which was a small future, but we got so bogged down with, you know, with everything else that was going on, the economic meltdown and everything in the mid 2000s that I just tabled it for about a decade, decade and a half. And about two years ago, almost, almost two and a half, three years ago, I, I came back up and said, you know, I, I brought the topic back up and said, I'm, I want to build a futures exchange now. We have a lot of customers. Um, I, can in, I can basically assure that we'll at least be able to introduce the product to people. And we need competition. The fees are too high. The data costs are too high. And we need products that are small, standard, and simple. So we built the small exchange. And together with investors from Citadel, from Jump, from interactive brokers, from Philip Capital, from Simplex, um, really from from uh, from Peak Six, and then of course from Tasty, um, we put together a package of some of the best prop firms in the world, along with some of the best retail firms, and we launched our own exchange to compete with the CME and the ICE, and we offer very simple, very straightforward products. We're introducing new products every couple of months. We'll have options in a couple of months, and basically. You know, we're just, I'm just an investor now. I mean, I'm chairman of the board, but I'm just an investor. And I look at this as this is true competition in products that are designed for retail investors. Everybody that's on this call today, every single person that's on this, on this Zoom chat today is perfect for this product. The average size is less than 20 shares of stock. And the capital efficiency is up to 16 times more efficient than buying stock outright. And we'll explain that a little bit later. Well, thank you so much for the, that background, and because that's exactly why I felt that this was such a, a perfect um, topic for you and I to discuss because of the of the audience that are here and the viewers here. This, I think, is a great segment into a lot of the things that we talk about here at Options Play. We talk about interest rates. We talk about gold and silver. Mm -hmm. We talk about uh, commodities. We talk about all of these products. And, and the question at the end of the day has always been, what's the best way to get exposure to these uh, these asset classes and these these um, yeah. views that we have in the markets. And largely, there hasn't been great ways for certain asset classes to, to get exposure through the equity market. So that's why we're here to introduce futures. So before we actually get started, I have a poll that I just launched um, on the Zoom uh, webinar. So if everyone could please just vote just to get a sense for the audience here in the room. I'm curious as to how many of you here have traded futures how many um, how many are new to op uh, how many are new to futures trading and what is your general experience with trading okay so it looks like the vast majority two thirds of you have more than five years of trading experience and only 30 percent of you have traded a futures contract before okay and this is with about 60 percent of you about 400 of you have voting voted so far so we'll keep that up for another minute but Tom I think that's a great insight into just a group here that 70 yeah. percent of viewers here have never traded a futures contract before but I'm guessing almost everyone here has traded a stock or options contract so just a quick introduction. Again, this is not a futures trading course. Uh, a futures contract is similar to an option contract. It's a contract between two parties that allows you to assume the risk of an asset over time. And trading it is very similar to trading an ETF. Um, it allows to allows you to access 
different markets. And the, the key here from a futures contract is the fact that they're standardized and they're exchange traded, which is another way to say that they are easily bought and sold. And there's usually plenty of liquidity for a retail, tr for a trader to be able to get in and out of the contract. The same way you expect that when you buy Apple stock or SPY or QQQ, that there is a liquid market that you can easily buy and sell uh, those contracts at. Now, I will say, I, I think Tom, I, I think you and I shared this this uh, view on futures is the fact that futures, there's a lot of different shapes and sizes. You can get access to a lot of different things, but the, the, the contract sizes sometimes are really perplexing as to how they came up with the contract sizes, right? Bushels of corn, 5,000 contracts, uh, 5,000 bushels of corn per contract. British pounds, 62 and a half thousand uh, barrels of oil, 1,000 barrels, uh, treasury bonds, 100,000. They're all over the map in terms of the size of them. So Tom, you've obviously traded a lot of futures. You know, you, I'm guessing you started on these types of standard futures contracts, correct? I started on the floor of the CBOE, which was an options exchange, but um, which now has like a couple of futures contracts. But but back then we did almost everything at the CME, you know, that we traded most of our futures products at the CME, but we traded primarily index products because that's where the, the era I grew up in. But I have traded um, professionally virtually every single futures contract that there is. And the only thing I want to mention, Tony, that I think is really important for people to understand there's a lot of people in this chat today. And I think the, the thing you just need to know is that in 2021, you know, in years past, people would say, I'm an option trader, or I'm a stock trader, or I'm, I'm a futures trader. But in 2021, you have, in order to be successful, because of the efficiency, and because of the need for, because the efficiency of the market, the need for capital efficiency, you have to say, hey, I'm a trader. So you have to be indifferent to product. Like it doesn't make a difference. We're gonna show you today, how it makes no difference. For example, if you trade, Tony said he started out trading S&P, the E-mini futures. The E-mini futures are the exact equivalent of 500 shares of spiders or the exact equivalent of 10 options in spiders. There's no difference. So like, as soon as you understand that you have an E-mini future, 500 shares or 10 options, you start to recognize that, hey, yes, I can be product indifferent. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about those futures products, right? Because you actually, you get a, a very uh, diverse group of direct exposure to a large number of asset classes that you traditionally do not have access to as a stock investor. And, and these days as a stock investor, you're not just following stocks anymore. You're following interest rates. You're following gold. You're following all these different asset classes. And if you watch any network of, of information or news, you're you're, you're seeing this type of, uh, of information across all these asset classes. And futures is one of the true ways to get direct ex exposure to these asset classes. And as you had said before, uh, futures uh, trading is extremely capital efficient. And Tom, why don't you just, just why don't you just explain a little bit as far as what you mean by capital efficiency okay. when it comes to futures? Because I don't think that's necessarily apparent to everyone. Sure. So, so it's it's a great topic. So here's how this works. In the U.S., there are mo there are different regulatory bodies based in Washington D.C. that that govern different um, financial products. The SEC and FINRA are the governing bodies for financial products such as stocks and options. Call them equity products. And in in the futures world, it's a different regulatory body. The CFTC governs the um, futures marketplace. So what happens is they have different margin requirements or different capital requirements to make trades. For stocks, you have to put up 50% overnight of the price of the stock. For options, if, you're, if you buy an option, you just pay for the option. If you sell an option, you put up about 20% of the price of the option. And those are essentially fixed numbers. They don't change. Well, the futures world, because it's newer, uses what they call span margining, S-P-A-N. And span margining, as, as governed by the, the CFTC and NFA, the National Futures Association, essentially margins differently. So the leverage is much greater. So the, the, the weird thing is, in, in a single brokerage account, like the Tastyworks, we have, to, we have to, you don't see it on the front end, but on the back end, we're actually segregating funds and using different margining systems. So what Tony was just alluding to, the reason futures are more capital efficient is because let's just, I'm gonna give you the most basic example. 
if if the S if SPY is trading for if SPY is trading for um, let's just call it you know four let's call it four hundred dollars it's close enough and it's fifty dollars a point that means one contract is two hundred thousand dollars that means if you're going to buy one futures contract for two hundred thousand dollars the the margin requirement overnight for everybody at every firm is the same let's just say it's about thirteen thousand dollars okay I'm just I'm just ballparking it. But if you were to buy 500 shares of stock, Tony, which is equivalent to that, 500 shares of stock um, is going to cost you, right, $100,000 because you're going to have to put up, it's a $200,000 investment of which you have to put up half or $100,000. So the difference between the margin requirement is almost eight times. And that's, that's a big difference. It, it I mean, absolutely is. And that's, and that's exactly... That's, yeah. Right. So you have to put up less capital to trade the same notional amount. Now I will say, you know, this is what we used to, I was a Forex trader before I was a futures trader and we dealt with a lot of leverage in, in Forex trading. And here's the thing is that Forex is even more capital efficient than trading futures, but that is also a double-edged sword. So you can now with your, instead of putting a hundred thousand dollars towards stocks, if you then applied a hundred thousand dollars towards futures, you can control a much larger position if you chose to do so. So there is that double-edged sword. I want to make sure investors understand that sure. it is capital efficient, requires less margin, which does mean that you can add more leverage. The more leverage you add, the more risk you are taking. So, but the one thing I want to remind investors, just because the leverage is there doesn't mean you have to use it. It just means that you can be more efficient with your capital. That's right. It means you can put on other positions too, and they don't have to have anything to do with that. You know, and the other, one other quick note about futures, which I think everybody needs to know, when you buy stock, Let's say you buy $100,000 worth of stock and you only want to put up 50,000. That's fine. Anybody can do that, but you pay margin on the other 50,000. When you trade a future and you buy $100,000 worth of a future for let's say $12,000, you only the 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 margin interest the borrow costs are already built into the futures product. So there's no additional like you never borrow money to trade futures or options. Never. There's right. no borrow requirements. So there's no margin for futures. There's no margin for futures options. And there's no margin for options. It's just a buying power, gonna, no margin. Yeah. And we're going to cover that cost of carry in, in okay, a little good. bit. Uh, but the other benefit is that is the fact that, as you said, this is a different type of contract than your option contract. So it is a 1256 contract, which is an IRA. IRS rule, which means that you it's taxed at a 60-40 uh, tax bracket. So 60% long-term capital gains, 40% short-term capital gains. So if you are trading in a taxable account, there are tax benefits to trading futures as well. But I think for a lot of investors, especially smaller retail investors, the benefit from a from a futures product from a from an active trading perspective is the fact that there's no day trading or pattern day trading rules because again CFTC and NFA do not have uh, pattern day trading rules so you can trade as much as you want in a small account under twenty five thousand dollars. Now there are some I would say uh, steep learning curves when it comes to futures. Number one is what we we're talking about. Number one, the fact that the, the contract sizes come in all different types of shapes and sizes, and that's really I think the, the challenge many times for beginners is learning all the different contract sizes. Not to mention that many of them are very very large. So if you want direct exposure to oil or gold, uh, many times those contracts in terms of size are simply outside of the scope of most retail investors. Uh, the other thing, actually, Tom, I think that's more confusing than the contract sizes are the tick sizes. Uh, you know, different products have different tick sizes, which is the minimum amount that the futures can trade in, in terms of movement, in terms of size. And for e-minis, they're twelve and a half dollars. For other ones, they're six. You know, six dollars. The, the the tick sizes are really different across the different spectrums, and it's just confusing to learn and figure them out before you start trading them. And it's crazy. I mean, bonds are still in fractions. And bonds and notes are still in fractions. Um, they haven't even been decimalized. This is the real reason behind the small exchange. When we say small, standard, and simple, the contract sizes are all the same, virtually the same. The tick sizes are all $1, and the expirations are all on the same date. The problem with like the CME futures is the notional size is too great. They all have different expirations, and they all have different multipliers or different contract sizes. We eliminated all of that. So retail investors can treat small exchange futures just like they would stock. And that's one of the beauties of the exchange. Right. 
and, and you know, the expiration dates will show you a calendar of just all the futures and how they're spread out throughout the entire month. So if you're trading different futures, you have to know which dates they, they expire with the small and we'll introduce this, they all expire on the same day. But really, you know, this is something, I don't know if you've heard of some, some horror stories or, or stories from, from traders who forgot to close out their futures contract at the end of the month and potentially had to take physical delivery of well, there's no, oil that, that, there's no more physical delivery. They've eliminated that. Right. So, so um, for, retail, for retail customers, like everybody listening today, there's no such thing as physical delivery anymore. It's all, it's all gone. You, can't, you couldn't accept it if you wanted to. It's only for hedgers. Retail investors to, cannot get physical delivery. I, I, that's exactly right. So now let's talk. So those are some of the challenges that you have with futures mm -hmm. trading, but let's talk a little bit about ETF products, right? Because nowadays there are a lot of ETFs that provide you with some form of exposure to many of these asset classes that futures provide you the direct exposure with. And it really spans the full gamut here. If anything, you have a lot more choices when it comes to ETFs. So number one, you have a very wide selection of assets. Uh, the, the great thing about ETFs is that they're really easy easy to understand, right? You buy one share of an ETF, if it goes up by a dollar, you make a dollar. If it goes down by a dollar, you lose a dollar. That's very simple. Tick sizes are all in one in penny increments, just like your stocks. So they're very easy to understand and you can trade them across any time horizon. So as long as you have the margins to hold on to an ETF, you can hold on to it indefinitely. There's no rules around how long you're gonna hold on to an ETF. But as we said before, they fall under the stock margining system. It's not very capital efficient because most all ETFs require anywhere from 50 to 100% of the cash in order to get into the trade. And in many ETFs, you might wanna trade actively like SPY or QQQ or GLD, but they are subject to the pattern day trading rules. So if you have an account under $25,000, you can only make four uh, uh, day trades within within a five. Uh, sorry, was it a four day trades and then five day period? I, I forget three, actually. Three I'll, within I'll three within five. Three within five. Um, so you're fairly limited in terms of the trades that you can make on an active basis. And a lot of traders, you know, that are that are especially these days, very short term, looking at looking at scalping opportunities within the day, can't can't do that. And some of the ETFs that track different assets, you see some pretty large tracking errors over time. Um, and this has to do with the transaction cost that the ETF needs to account for to hold on to these, you know, whether you're looking at exposure to some volatility products, um, um, if you're looking for volatility products or if you're looking for exposure to sometimes gold, silver, oil, um, more so on the oil side, I want to say, where you see some of that um, tracking error uh, on ETF. So with that, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the benefit of both, right? So we see the benefit of futures. We see the benefit of ETFs. Um, and let's talk a little bit about this, the small exchange. So this is really where I think, you know, we were talking before, it really merges the efficiency of futures with the ease of stocks so that you can have access to both in these small futures. Apologies for the background noise here for one second, but um you're going to be able to access both of these through the small exchange futures. So, and Tom, I think this is what you were talking about. I think what the small futures really embody is the small standard and, and simple. So why don't you talk a little bit about kind of the, the, the thought process behind the, the, this, the three here at, as to, you know, the, how you're thinking about these small products. Well, the reason that I wanted to do a small futures product and the CME kind of copied us and they, they did micro futures before we were able to launch the small exchange because they, they realized that we were onto something. But the small, this, this I, like, like I said before, $100,000 is too big for the average retail customer. And so for us, something like five, 10, $15,000 up to 20,000 made the most sense. So small was a layup. You know, in the world of trading for retail investors, the only thing that can mess you up like we like to say when genius fails, it fails due to size. Tony, you know that, that it's, it's rare for us to do something incredibly stupid other than size. Like, like you can almost justify everything you do in the yeah. trading world, except if you get too big and you get caught, you can't recover. So, so right. when genius fails, it's always size. So the most important thing was size. The standardization was important to me because it didn't make sense to have to have a retail investor try to learn all the different multipliers, all the different expiration dates, all the different sizes of contracts. 
like, you know, like a, a, a British pound is half the size of a Euro contract and a, a gold contract is different than a silver contract and the S&Ps are different than the NASDAQ. Doesn't make any sense. So let's standardize everything and let's make, let's give the same expiration date, the same tick sizes, the same roll dates, make everything the same. So like if I want to trade an ETF like GLD, or I want to trade a small exchange um, gold future or a global oil future or a, or a, or a dollar future index, it, it doesn't matter which one I trade. It's just like buying or selling any ETF or stock and keep it simple. You know, let's not overcomplicate finance. Finance has enough risk to it and, and it's plenty efficient. So let's make it into a game of strategy and let's keep everything right in front of us so that if, if an individual investor wants to choose a highly leveraged futures product so they can put on more, remember, Tony said this just before, which is really important. The reason leverage is so important is because leverage affords you the opportunity to play what we call law of large numbers. So let's just say Tony has 10 trades he likes this week. If you run out of money on the third trade, then you can't really spread the risk out and diversify over 10 trades and 10 strategies. But if you have enough capital to do all 10 and each, to, each trade has, is a high probability trade in its own right, you have a statistical or a mathematical chance of being much better chance of being more successful. And that's where law of large numbers comes in. So you keep things small, standard, simple, and you keep individual investors indifferent to product and you give them the best chance for success. And the last thing, Tony, that we were able to do is we were able to reduce the fees so that the small exchange, the average commission, well, let's just say with Tastyworks, it's only 25 cents a contract. And, and for the CME products, it's $1.25. And then, um, so it's only 25 cents a contract and the exchange fees are only either seven or 15 cents, which compared to $1.16 or $1.23 at the CME. So the fees are a fraction of the number. So it's capital efficient and it's also fee efficient. And, and I think that's exactly, so, so let's just do a quick review here. And thank you so much for that background. You know, the, the average contract size of a small, uh, a, future, a small futures product is anywhere from $500 to $20,000. And the margin requirement is anywhere from 1% to 25%, depending on which product you're trading. And we're gonna go through some of those products versus mm -hmm. futures, substantially larger contract size and ETFs require substantially more margin than trading the smalls futures. So, and then the, the standardization in terms of tick sizes. I, I think, you know, for me, the most confusing thing with trading futures was, was really the tick sizes, learning all the different tick sizes across the different contracts that you could trade. So all small uh, contracts trade in $1 increments. So, or each contract that you're trading, each tick is going to be worth $1. The tick is actually, the tick size is actually a, a penny, uh, but multiplied by the 100 contract multiplier, which all small uh, products have that 100 multiplier means it's equivalent of trading 100 shares and they trade in dollar in, in, in penny increments just like an ETF. So for those of you that are familiar with trading 100 shares of ETF, this is really a direct translation to what you would experience as trading a stock with 100 shares. Exactly. And on the expiration side, you know, this is this is an expiration calendar. This is this is this is pulled from uh, what you see on the CME. So depending on what product you trade, look at how spread out the uh, the uh, even FX, depending on which um, which. Uh, currency you're trading, you have different expiration dates. On oil and, and gas, you're trading different um, expiration dates. So the expiration dates are spread out all over the place on, on, on the standard futures. For small futures, they all expire on the third Friday of the month, just like your options, the monthly options that you're used to trading. So really easy to remember and easy to understand when it comes to expiration. And lastly, simple. And this really comes down to you know the innovation that I you know, I can say I see in these products, you know, when I was first introduced to these products, you know, I, I, we started having conversations about a year ago about doing education. And at the time I was learning about the products, you know, there were a few that really jumped out at me. And at the time they actually weren't available, which were the interest rate future, uh, the interest rate futures, mm -hmm. you know, for anyone who's ever traded um, you know, we always quote in, in interest rate terms in terms of yield, right? We look at the 10-year yield. We talk about where we think the yields are going to go. 
but you can't trade a yield. You can only trade the bond itself. And the bonds are quoted in a very different pricing than what you see in terms of the yields that we look at in terms of analytics. So this is really, you know, for me, the, the most simple way to trade treasury yields because you guys offer a futures product on the yield itself. So Tom, let's just address that alone. Yeah, sure. You know, for me, that was a huge game changer of retail traders being able to take trade the yield directly. It, it, no other product exists right now that allows you to do that. No, and it's been a great release. We have three bond products on the small exchange. We have the 30-year, the 10-year, and the two-year. And later on, if we have some time, I'll show you on the platform. But just to give you an example, the 30-year today, um, which is on the, on the, it trades on the CME, the Chicago, well, actually it's a board of trade product. But the 30-year today closed at 155.07. Now, the reason I say this, it's forward slash ZB. And it's 155.07 is the closing price. Now, if you're a retail investor, 155.07, what does that mean? Do, do you know what I mean? Like you have no idea what 155.07 means. I mean, you know, yes, you can figure out that it's 155 and 730 seconds. But my point is you don't know what that translates into in yield. Now, if you go pull up exactly. the small, if you pull up the small exchange product here, the 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 yeah, the 30 year small exchange. You can see that that product today closed at um, uh, 20, well, it closed at uh, 24, 24 even, okay? That's 2.4%. That's it. Like, that's how simple it is. It closed at 2.4%. So that's exactly what the return is on the 30-year bond. And if you think the interest rates are going higher, you buy it. Hope that it, go high, hope that it goes from 2 point, you know, from 2.4% from, um, from to 2.4%. Or one two percent, or two point five percent. I mean, whatever you think it's going to go to, and you just buy it on interest. And so simple because you know you're just looking at the straight interest rate rather than trying to convert. You know, if you're trading, just as an example, the ten-year note today. I'm just looking at another screen just in front of me. Um, the ten-year note today closed at one thirty-one and thirty thirty seconds. Nobody knows what that equals as far as yield. I mean, it's not possible. You have to back into it. It's a whole formula. It's a pain. The small exchange, um, 1658. That's 1.658%. Done. I mean, that's exactly. So yeah, we're actually going to go through an example of this to, to make this just the crystal clear. I do want to go through the other products that are available. Sure, sure, sure. You can also trade two um, equity index products, which for many investors that are used to trading SPY or QQQ, you're familiar with similar type products. Uh, that's the small technology 60, which to me is, is somewhat similar to the NASDAQ 100 index in terms of uh, the, the, cons the constituents, the small 75s. Uh, that's closer to the S&P 500 or the, or the Russell 2000 as just a broad-based index, giving you exposure to broad-based equities. And then the U.S. dollar, uh, the small U.S. dollar index and the small precious metals index. So, Tom, t why, don't you t why don't we talk through the U.S. dollar index and, and the precious metal index? Because they are a little different than what users are used to yeah. when we refer to the dollar index. So the precious metal index is really cool. It's, it's a combination of gold silver and platinum. I'm going to give you the exact percentages. It's 58% gold, 34% silver, and 8% platinum. Now, the reason we did that is because a lot of people like to trade gold and silver, but there is no um, gold and silver mix ETF. You either have to trade SLV for silver, or you can trade GLD for gold, which are both good products. But the difference on the small exchange is that um, you can trade the single future, and it's the equivalent of 55 shares of GLD. And, and the neat thing about it is, I'm just looking at making sure I have all the ratios perfect. The correlation is 0.85. That's a long-term correlation of 0.85. So it tracks it almost beautifully. And it's the equivalent of 55 shares. Now, just think about this. The overnight requirement, Tony, is $500 for one future. Now, if you were to do 55 shares of GLD, it's about $160 stock, let's say. And so... 55 shares would be what? About eight, a little over 8,000, right? If you were just to buy the, if you were to buy 55 shares of GLD, it would be about $8,000. If you were to buy one small exchange future, it's $500 overnight. It's virtually the exact same trade. And that's yeah, and, about and, capital efficiency. And I remember the first time looking at this precious metal index saying, well, 
you know, how, how do I know whether I think gold, silver, and platinum are going to move up in one day and, and move down in one day? What if gold moves up one day and silver moves down the other day? Um, you know, and we see some of that. But I, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that many times when you're trading gold and silver, uh, you know, you might be long precious metals, but sometimes you're long gold, but the move happens in silver, or you're long silver and the move happens in gold, and you miss out on that move, right? So with this precious metals index, you can actually get access to all uh, uh, effectively a diversified basket of precious metals. So it doesn't matter whether if it's gold or silver that moves, you get partial exposure to that. And, and that really, I think, is quite neat. It's the equivalent of 30 shares of GLD and 100 shares of SLV or 55 shares of GLD. Like we, that's how easy we've broken it all down. So you can look at it two ways. If you like trading SLV, it's 30 shares of GLD and 100 shares of SLV is one future, or it's 55 shares of GLD. And it's that, that's the tightest correlation so that we help people you know, just to talk about capital efficiency, but it saves you $7,500 in capital and it moves almost exactly the same. Now you, you asked um, about, you asked about the small dollar index. We, there, yeah. is, there is no good dollar index for retail investors, um, even on the CME. Um, you'd have to trade any one of the individual currencies. So we created something called SFX, which is the small exchange dollar index, which is 34% euro. And then the balance, um, it's 34% euro, it's it's 25% Chinese currency. And then the balance of about 45 to 50% is five different currencies. And so it's seven currencies total. And basically, if you were looking at it versus a specific product, it's about 70, 75 shares of, FF, of FXE or 450 shares of UUP. And the overnight requirement for this, which is amazing, is only $165. Right. 1% of the contracts. Is it 1% or 2% of the, of the contract value? I think it's 1%. I don't uh, have that right in front of me, so I'm not sure. And the correlation to UUP, so UUP mm -hmm. is is the um, how how a lot of people trade an ETF on the U.S. dollar, and it's the equivalent right. of 450 shares. It has a 90% correlation to that, and these are very active. They're liquid, and don't forget there'll be options on all of these in June. So we haven't we've right. we, we've built an options, um, we've built options on futures and they're all span margin, but we're just waiting for final OCC approval. Right, uh, well, that's really good to know. And I know that there's other contracts coming down the line as well, right? On oil, um, oil and, and other products. Cannabis and Bitcoin. So we are super excited. We can't wait for oil. Can Oil's coming, I think in about 10, less than 10 days, but cannabis, um, we have the product in the process of being approved and Bitcoin, we're waiting for approval. That'll be very, very exciting to see the Bitcoin future available. So, yeah, you know what it's going to uh, be? Know, it's 1 100. 1 100. Wow. So, so, Bitcoin is currently close today at 58,000. So, it'll be a $5,800 contract, 1 100th. Wow. Perfect size for retail. Exactly. So exactly. So I, I think the best way to, to kind of get into this is just to go through some examples because we've been talking about the 10 year yield quite a bit here at, at, at options play. And okay. here I have a long term chart. This is a five year chart of or, or slightly longer, than, uh, slightly shorter than that four year chart of, of, of the 10 year yield. You've had a big move to the downside from about 325 basis points down to 50 basis points. And we've now retraced more than 38.2%, which is a FIB level that we've been watching. And we're expecting that this could still have a little bit more upside into the 195, 190 basis point level here, which is the 50% FIB level. So just looking at the just general directional view, you have a pretty strong uptrend that it's been in for the past, uh, let's just call it four and a half months or so. Yep. We managed to break above 155 basis points, which is a major resistance level we've been looking at. The RSI currently is a little bit overbought, so there is some concern that there's a bit of a pullback that we might see, but it's cross above the 20-day, the 50-day moving average. So things are certainly all up trending here uh, higher uh, from, from where we were. So this is something that we talk about quite a bit here at Options Play, is really how do you play this, right? You have a directional view on, on rates, uh, specifically the 10-year. How do you play it? Do you use TLT? Do you short TLT? Do you go long financials through XLF? Do you use KRE? None of these are straight directional bets on the actual 10-year yield. Most of these are actually quite 
um, or, you know, the correlation is not that high with the exception of TLT. And, you know, with XLF and KRE, you have other risks in, involved in, in trading that. So, you know, and, and if you were ever to trade a bond itself, we were talking about this before, you have to convert those bond prices that you were quoting before into yield terms before you can trade them to determine where do you get out? Where's your profit level? Where's your um, stop loss level? And not to mention, some of these are hard to borrow for shorts if you wanted to take a short position on some of these. And, and for TLT, you have to short TLT in order to uh, go long rates. So there's all this complexity that's added to it. So Tom, why don't we go through an example of just, we have a bullish view here on, on interest rates. How could we achieve that through the small futures product as opposed to traditionally what we might what we might be using today using the ETF products. Yeah, so the ETF products are very difficult with ten year notes. I know you're. I, I know you. There, there's a couple more that just. I, I just made a note to myself. There's one that's IEF, which doesn't trade very liquid, but we've traded it a couple times in the past. It's seven to ten year, and there's also. Um, well, that's really the only one that's kind of the TLT is a little bit longer term, but again. You know, you're talking about $135 stock in TLT with an extremely low volatility. So it's, it's tough to play. Like if you're thinking about, you know, you want to sell calls in there because you're, you know, because um, you're a little bit bullish on interest rates. The hard thing, Tony, for individual investors is when you start trying to trade bonds for the average customer, you know how hard this is because you're doing things inversely. So, you know, bonds have an inverse relationship with interest rates. So the hardest thing for me to do as, as a financial, you know, as a content, as, as a creator of financial content and as an educator in the financial space, you know, I love telling people, hey, you know, I, I'm bullish on the yield curve here. I think it's going to expand or I think interest rates are going to go higher. And then you say, well, what would you do? And then you go, well, I would short TLT. <laughs> and they're like, hold on. You just said they're going to go higher. Why are you shorting it? And they go, well, it has an inverse relationship. Price and yields have an inverse relationship. And people just look at you, you know, a little bit cross-eyed, a little bit like, I don't get it. And I don't blame you. I wouldn't get it either if I hadn't been doing this for 40 years. So, so the, the nice thing about the small exchanges, if you want to, if you think rates are going higher, you just buy it. You just buy the 10 year product. And if you think rates are going lower, you just sell the 10 year product. That's the simplicity of it. And it just took out all that crazy conversion you know, the 10-year note on the on the Board of Trade, the most actively traded debt contract in the world is the 10-year note. If you can bring it up for a second, forward slash ZN. So this is the most actively traded debt contract. It usually trades, you know, I don't know how many, it usually trades over a million contracts. How many to trade that can't read on your screen? Two million? 2.43. Yeah, so it traded 2.43 million contracts. That is the most actively traded contract, essentially, in all the futures markets today. Now, this trades in 30 seconds. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry. This trades, the 10 year trades in 60 fourths. The bonds trade in 30 seconds. And so you're still using fractions. It is extremely difficult for retail investors to convert fractions into yield, if not virtually impossible. So, again, to answer Tony's questions, how would I play? the 10 year yield, if I wanted to keep it a little bit to the long side, I would probably just buy small exchange 10 year futures. They're very inexpensive to trade. Do you know what the margin requirement is on a 10 year? It's only $200 on the small exchange. So for $200, you get participation um, in, in the yields. The, the, the notional size, um, uh, the notional size on this is, the equivalent of, hang on, TLT. It's a, the equivalent of 25 shares of TLT or 100 shares of IEF. So if you bring up IEF right here, because it'll just be easier to do the math. So just to give you an idea of the notional size. So it's 100 shares of that stock and you put up $200. You can't beat that. Right. As far as capital right. requirements go. Right. So I just want to walk investors through. So the the ten year yield is currently trading at 16, 16, uh, 1653 by sixteen fifty eight. That's the current bid ask on this. Just to, just so you know, 
just so investors here, especially if you're new to options, uh, if new to futures trading, you can think of this like an ETF that's currently priced at $16.58. And each futures contract is for 100 shares of this ETF. Now it's not an ETF that you're trading and it's not a hundred shares of it. It is a futures contract, but each futures contract is a hundred multiplier, just like your option contract. So when you see a $16.58 uh, asking price on this futures contract, when you buy one contract of it, it's the equivalent of buying a $1,658 contract. And your margin requirement, as you said, is 200, in this particular case is $220. And what this gives you is a direct exposure to the, the 10 year yield because the current 10 year yield is effectively uh, be, um, uh, six, uh, 165 basis points, 166 basis points. So if you think it's gonna go higher, you buy the future, if you think the interest rate is going lower, you, you short the future. Um, and that's how simple it is to trade the interest rate through these products. And this is by, uh, you know, I think is the, is the most innovative product that I've seen on the futures exchanges uh, in, in a long time. Yeah, it's just, listen, we just, we just wanted to, we want to take all the craziness out of it. There was a reason only 1% of people traded futures products was because really the only one most people understood was the stock index products. And, it, and we know people like to trade interest rates. They like to trade gold. They like to trade the dollar, but it's too complicated. So let's just make it super simple. That's all we did. Yeah. Um, the next one, I want to take a look at the US dollar. And the reason I want to look at the US dollar is because this is one that we actually talk about a lot. Uh, if any of you have watched you know, me, Mike, and Carter on CNBC over the last past four months, this is one of the, the consistent trades that we've made over the past four months. But as the one thing that you'll notice is that each time we make this trade, we're using products that aren't directly tied to the dollar. With the exception of UUP, that is the only uh, ETF that's close to the dollar index, but you'll see us making trades of being long FCX because you know copper has an inverse correlation to the dollar and we're long copper when we're short the dollar. That's not, I, you know, I, it, it, it pains me to have to use a product like FCX or EEM to play a short dollar play because there isn't a better a product to trade in the equity option space. So I wanted to use um, the dollar as an example because sure. it recently completed what I believe is a bottoming formation here. Uh, after underperforming for a long period of time, you have this bottoming formation and finally broke out above it, came back to retest this as support, and I think has the potential of, of rising going forward. And the resistance so far has been confirmed as support. The RSI recently turned positive and we've crossed above both the 20 and the 50 day moving averages. So certainly things technically speaking are starting to turn around to the upside. And the question for equity investors is what is the right product to trade on this? And there isn't a great product other than UUP. And especially if you have a short, if you have a, sh a bearish view here on, on the dollar, which is what we have had over the past four months, is that shorting UUP is also also not particularly easy because it's an, it's hard to borrow UUP. So it, it, there's there's a lot of challenges when it comes to being uh, short the dollar. In this particular case, we are bullish here on the dollar. So let's take a look at uh, trading the U.S. dollar using the futures product. So this is the dollar index. I'll just bring up the dollar index. This is the index itself. Um, let's bring up the chart. Uh, as you can see, we've had a big move to the downside. This is the one minute chart. This is the intraday chart. Let's look at the daily chart for one second. This is the daily chart for the dollar. We've had a big move here to the downside here today, perhaps reversing and breaking below these support levels and maybe continuing lower here today. So maybe my views have changed a little bit. We'll have to, we're at a pretty pivotal level, I would say here for the dollar. But if you were to, you know, take a bearish view here on the dollar, it's as simple as shorting this futures contract. So Tom, let's talk about that, that trade yeah. real quick. It's one of my favorite contracts that we put together because I had no way to trade dollars. And I was always using the, the mini contract at the CME to trade the Euro. Um, I do like trading currency options. And we will obviously be offering those in June, but I do like currency options, but the IV rank right now is very low. But that said, UUP to me is not tradable in the options because the implied volatility is only 
um, about 10% in UUP. And the expected move over the course of like the next month, 30 days, the expected move in there is only 32 cents. So you can't, you know, you know the option world, Tony, in, with a 32 cent expected move, you can see it right next to, if you go from April on the right-hand column, you can see the expected move, it's about 32 cents. You, there's nothing you can do with a 32 cent expected move. So UUP is straight directional play, just like you were talking about. Now, if the, if the one contract of SFX is, and just this is the hard part for everybody. So one SFX contract is the equivalent of 450 shares of UUP. So take $24.50, multiply it by 400, and you're coming up basically with a little over $10,000 required to trade something that, um, that on the small exchange costs $200 without the borrow costs. So it's $200 versus 10,000. I mean, to me, it's just an absolute no brainer. I don't know why anybody would put up $10,000 to trade something that you can trade for 200. It's the exact same, it's the exact same thing. And then you can just use the money for something else. Yeah, so that's the capital efficiency that we're talking about, right? If you were to trade, if you were to short a UUP, you would need to, uh, you know, this is a $10,000 effective notional size here you're trading the same notional size for just a, you know, the buying power effect here is $181. So that's the only, that's the margin that to you borrow. have to put up. And you can exactly. short it too. Exactly. So you can, and that's the thing about futures is that it is just as efficient being long edited as it is short. So you can take any directional, you can take a directional view on both sides without having to worry about borrow costs and things like that, especially in something that's, that's not, that's uh, hard to borrow like, like the dollar. Um, so this allows you to take a directional exposure long or short very easily on interest rates, on dollar, on precious metals, on even this, uh, the stock indices. Um, but I, I will say, you know, I want to focus our attention on some of these things that are not easy to replicate using equities, you know, especially the U.S. dollar and the interest rate uh, products here. So this allows you to uh, put in an order to short the dollar index or go long the dollar index the same way you would an ETF that's currently priced at $145, but again, only requiring $181 in margin to trade this one contract. So... Tom, I think we've covered quite a few examples here. Just to recap, you know, the small exchange is really something that you can use, in my opinion, to the small exchange products are used to speculate when you have, uh, you know, a, a short term directional view on indices, on interest rates, on gold and silver. On, uh, on, on the US dollar for those of you that are currency traders, you can also use it to invest in long-term direction. And, and I think the dollar is probably the best example of, of a product that you can use to take a long-term directional view on the US dollar and maintain that trade with relatively, uh, with very little margin to, to stay in that trade. And lastly, hedge your portfolio against uh, downturn. So, you know, Tom, uh, as options traders, Many times, you know, when we talk about hedging, the first product we jump to is talking about options. But I always tell investors, you should actually use options as a hedging tool as your last resort. There are better options to hedge your portfolio than options. Uh, you know, you're better off moving into cash if that's if, because that's the most efficient way to, to hedge your portfolio against a downturn. But if you don't want to move into cash and you want to remain invested, I think futures is probably the second best uh, option that you have. And only if for any reason that you can't trade futures or the size is too large for your portfolio, do you then turn to potentially options. But with the small exchange, you know, especially the, in the um, equity index products that are relatively small, you can really hedge a fairly small equity portfolio against a market downturn using these equity future, uh, using these um, uh, indice futures. Yeah, you are spot on. And, and I, this is a tough, tough discussion to have because usually when you and I do a webinar, we're talking about option strategies and people can, you know, 99% of the people on have done it this before. So it makes a lot more sense to them, you know, and, and strategic investing. Um, futures are what we call static. Options are dynamic. So options, you can use options to be very strategic because they have dynamic char characteristics to them. They have dynamic properties, meaning that they have time value. In the world of futures, they are static. They're very much like stocks, just more capital efficient. So you use them when you want, just like Tony said, a static hedge or a, a static directional play 
Um, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to get, in order to make more option trades, you have to have more portfolio sensibility, more portfolio capital efficiency. And that's why this discussion is so important. It's just, it's, it's just a hard topic. You know, do you know what I'm saying, Tony? It's just, it's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's, that's just a recap of, of, you know, what we discussed here today. I do want to discuss a few things that I think uh, many investors will have questions around, or these are the questions that we tend to hear from investors with respect to futures. And I think this is a great way to wrap this up. You know, okay. we talked about the margining system being different between equities and, and, and futures, and really the futures allow us to, to uh, get into a contract at far little margin, uh, far a smaller amount of margin. So, could we walk through what happens at the end of the day with a futures contract and what exactly is this term that's called mark to market? How does that work? And, and how does, um, what happens at the end of the day with your futures contract? So the way the futures work, which is a little different than stocks is futures, the, each brokerage firm is technically allowed to charge whatever they want intraday, but at night, everybody has to have the same requirement. So at the end of the day, which in most cases is at 3.15 central time, so 4.15 if you live in New York or you know 1.15 if you're on the West Coast, um, at that particular time, that's when the official day ends and everybody has to have the same overnight requirement. That's what they call kind of the end of day mark. That is essentially your mark to market. And that's a term, you know, you have to see futures are 24.5. For the most part, they're 24.5. So since they go around the clock, you always have to have the capital required to hold the trade. So the, the mark to market doesn't, mark to market just means where that particular um, future is being marked and whatever is considered the end of that particular um, duration or that, that time frame, that day. Um, it doesn't matter much anymore because since we go 24 hours a day, now what happens in the futures world is um, they'll close them at 3.15 and they'll reopen them right again at 3.30. So it's just like the start of a new day. So the market mark, mark right. to market doesn't even come into play anymore. Right. Okay, great. So, I mean, that's a question that we tend to get a lot with, with uh, futures traders with just kind of how daily settlement works and then what, what impact that has on, on, on investors' positions. You just um, have to have so the capital to hold the position. That's all you need. Right. Um, so what's the difference between in initial and maintenance margin? You actually touched up on this a little bit in, in the previous one, but just to, just so in investors understand, because you know when you right. look at a futures contract, you see the initial margin and then you see the maintenance margin. What is the difference? So what, what they call in the futures world, initial and maintenance are from stock, are stock terms. In the futures world, they call it intraday. So intraday, you can technically, whatever the brokerage firm charges, we charge 25% intraday. Some firms charge 50, some firms charge 10, um, but we charge 25% intraday. And then overnight, it's 100%. So every firm charges the exact same. You cannot discount customers. That's a regulatory requirement. So, so the difference is intraday, it is whatever the firm decides they want to charge. We are pretty standard, like um, Tastyworks, TD, E-Trade, um, Interactive Brokers, almost everybody's right around 25% intraday and then overnight it's 100 percent of whatever the requirement is and we today by the way we only gave you overnight requirements we never mentioned intraday one one bit okay perfect excellent that's exactly why what i was hoping to to cover here so you know let's talk a little bit about what happens if you hold a futures contract to expiration let's say i forget to close out my futures contract there's actually an expiration coming up this friday mm -hmm. i got a notification on my small exchange that uh, on my on my account that i have to close out my my futures contract but what happens if i do if i fail to do that and i hold this through expiration well it it depends on the type of future so, and uh, with, with the small exchange, everything settles to cash. So if you do nothing on the small exchange, it just cash settles. So there's nothing you have to do. You don't have to worry about anything. So the small exchange, we made it super simple. Every single product on the small exchange settles to cash. There is no, it doesn't settle to some physical. It doesn't settle to some other month. It doesn't roll or anything. We don't close you out. It just settles to cash. But if you have another futures contract, it depends. Like if you have an S&P contract, it'll settle to cash on Friday. But if you have some other contracts that would settle to a physical like gold or silver or something like that, the brokerage firm will make you cover it. Like crude oil, you'll be forced to cover. So we'll send out 
lots of reminders. And if by the last day you haven't covered, we'll cover it for you. But we don't want we don't want to cover it for you. So we want you to cover it. So you're you're forced to cover, but you can also roll. So on on like on our platform, there's really simple roll um, features. You just click one button and you can roll from this month to next month. Super simple. That's that's great to know um, because I have a few positions that I need to roll, and uh, that was just a good reminder for me to do. Tony, that. all you do um, is all you do is right click on your futures position, and you can choose choose futures roll. So if you have a futures it. position there, you just open it up, you right click on it, just choose futures roll, and roll to the next month. It's one. The whole process takes one click. There you go. Review and send and send. That's it. One click, you're awesome. rolled. That's great to know. Um, so for those of you trading at Tasty, that's how easy it is to roll your futures contract or your small futures contract. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about leverage, because I do think that this is something that I, as a, you know, as an educator, spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the psychology around trading and, man and risk management of trading. And, and really, you know, when you when we talk about capital efficiency, right? The, the, we're really also at the same time talking about leverage. And when you give that, uh, when the maintenance, when the, when the margin requirement is so low on some contracts, some users can use that, I would say, um, uh, to their advantage by leveraging up their capital and trading substantially larger notional size than the capital they actually have in their portfolio. So let's talk a little bit about the leverage that you can actually receive on trading futures. You know, what is the range that you're seeing and, and kind of how can you, how do you as an, as a trader determine how much leverage you choose to use in your portfolio? Well, this is a whole huge, you know, discussion, but like I said before, the most, the most important thing is to always keep your size in check. Now we have lots of different rules that we use based on the different mixture of products that we're using everything else. But for most individual investors, I would be very careful not to use more than, you know, like on the low end, 30 to 40% on the high end, you know, 60 to 70%. It really depends on account size, but we've done an incredible amount of research, Tony, on like, how do you recover from a bad drawdown? And if you're over 65 or 70 percent capital in use, it's very difficult to recover. If you're closer to 40 or 50 percent, you can recover strategically. So what we do is, um, and we assume that people have, like for me, for example, I'm about 20 percent futures. I'm 80 percent options and about 20 percent futures and futures options. So that's how my that's how my portfolio breaks down. So what I do is I try to be around between 30 and 40% capital usage and an 80, 20 breakdown between options and then my futures positions. And I'm pretty steady in there. And that gives you a lot of room to be wrong, but you know what, how much leverage can you receive trading futures? It could be as much as, it could be as little as five to six times regular equity and it could be as much as 16 times. So you have to be very careful that you just use them correctly. Like you've been talking about all day, just make sure that you're using them so you can put on lots of other positions rather than just bigger positions. Never use futures if all you're trying to do is get bigger. Never ever do that, huge mistake. Yeah, so that's that's the one you know thing that I, that I want to carry forward as, you know, as a currency trader, I saw so many investors leverage their their cap, the cash that they have in their account, 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 times the cash amount they had in their account in terms of notional value that they were trading. And that led to some very spectacular blowups that I had seen. So I just want to, uh, you know, for investors who are, you know, since 70% of you said that you never traded a futures contract, you're learning about the capital efficiency and you're learning that, hey, I can control a much larger position than the cash that I have. Be careful with that. You generally don't want to extend your too much beyond the same margining system that you have in equities so that you don't blow up your accounts. It just is more capital efficient so that you can have, you know, a hundred thousand dollar equities position, but still have that cash that aside to maybe sell some cash secured puts or do other trades with it. It doesn't mean that you should necessarily leverage your capital to the eyeballs, even though you can. We keep hammering home that the only way for this to fall apart and for genius to fail is is really, it's you know, you get your thighs too big. And if you've never read the book, When Genius Fails, um, uh, it's a story about, it's a real story about long-term capital management in 1998. 
and it's about three or four Nobel Prize winners who built all the, you know, the, the Black Scholes model, essentially Myron Scholes and a bunch of other guys that essentially won Nobel Prize for, you know, for, for building the option models. And they blew out because their size got too big. And it's a great book to really put some perspective. I, have you, I don't know if you've read it, Tony, but it's, it's a little old, but it's a great book to put perspective around size. Um, I have not read that book, but I'm going to put that on my list of books to read. Um, I, I also uh, encourage a lot of investors to read Finite versus Infinite Game because you know trading is a, is a is an infinite game. Yet most investors, the way they they talk about trading and wins and losses, really approach it more from a finite game, and it's really not a finite game. And, and we and you refer to you know getting back from drawdowns, right? You know we really need to think about drawdowns as really um, not as losses, but just uh, you know, when you're playing the infinite game, you're not so much concerned about how much money can you make. You're, you're more concerned about how much, how much can I control my downside? Because the more you can control your downside, the more, the higher probability you have of succeeding with trading. Um, and that really just takes an infinite approach to, to, to thinking about your, your trading account. So Tom, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I just want to remind all investors, if you're interested in trading these small exchange futures, you can do it at Tastyworks. Um, I've posted a link here into the chat window. I'll post it again into the chat window for those of you that would like to open an account at Tastyworks to trade these small futures. I'm going to be coming back and talking about these products here over the next few weeks, but I'm really glad that I was able to talk to you guys for the first time with Tom here, who, is going, who has, I think, been a fantastic uh, host here to talk about these products and, and just you know why you created it. And I think that really speaks to the viewers that we have here. So Tom, Tom, thank you so much. Any parting words before we close off here for today? No, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm always accessible if somebody has any questions, but I think that, um, I, I, I think we said it earlier, the, the most important takeaways from today is that you have to be, in 2021, in order to, like, like, what's our job as a broker? It's to facilitate opportunity. It's to build really cool technology and, and to offer all products and to facilitate the ability. Like, you can use these products in an IRA account. You can use them, you know, you can use options, futures on options, anything you want in a tasty IRA. You, we don't limit you. And we don't limit you to being able to trade these products. And so I think what's the most important thing is, you know, in order to facilitate opportunity, we have to give you access to all products, all strategies, you know, cool technology, cool content, and basically, you know, understand what you, how difficult this is for retail investors and just keep things, you know, like always simple right in front of you and feature rich. And that's what we do. Yeah. And in this day and age, you know, you, you see, these asset classes that you can trade with futures, even if you're not trading them as a stock investor, right? If you're trading stocks today, you're seeing gold, you're seeing silver, you're seeing dollar, you're seeing interest sure. rates, and maybe you're not, you just you just haven't found the way to access them. But in reality, you you do. So this is really why I, I'm very glad to be introducing this here with you, Tom, today, just to give our our investors, uh, you know, visibility into trading the products that we talk about every single day. Um, so again, Tom, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. I hope you have a great trading day. And everyone, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We will send you an email once we finish processing the recording here this afternoon. So you can review this at any time. We'll also send you some information about the small exchange and how to open an account here at Tasty so you can have access to all of this. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great trading day and I'll see you guys here tomorrow afternoon on our next options education session. Thank you Thanks, so much Tommy. and have a great night. Thanks, Tom.